Good morning. And thank you so much, Dr. Eichen, for your welcome. It's nice to be back here at Wheaton. I've been once or twice before. I think it's the first time I've preached in chapel. Uh, but it's my first ever visit to the United States was to a conference at Wheaton in 1987, before some of you were born, probably, uh, when I first came here. So it's good to be here uh, and to be among you. And just to stop you thinking all the way through my talk, where I come from, uh, the accent is from Northern Ireland. Uh, that's where I was born and grew up, but uh, my, and I live with my wife Liz in London, in England, and work there for the Langham Partnership, as Dr. Riken said. So it's good to be here and to be with you. Now, I hope you have uh, that text that was read to us from Matthew chapter 4. I'm aware, uh, I've been well informed that you're working your way through on Mondays through the Gospels and been looking at these texts in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, and if you could have that open in front of you, it'd be wonderful, either in a Bible, an actual Bible, you still have these uh, things with paper, uh, uh, Bible, or on a phone, or like Moses, perhaps on a tablet. Uh, but wherever, <laughs> wherever you have the Word of God, it's good to be, be looking at it. Let's pray as we begin. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Matthew who wrote it. And we ask for your Holy Spirit now to speak to us through these words and this story for Jesus' sake. Amen. Those words we were just singing, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, might well have been said uh, by the people in this story, Peter, Andrew, James, John. The theme of radical discipleship which you possibly saw on the screen as you came in, uh, is indeed the theme of the symposium uh, of uh, hunger here at Wheaton this, these couple of days, today and tomorrow. But it would also, of course, be a very good title precisely for this passage of Scripture, uh, especially that central paragraph, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22, when Jesus calls his disciples. But we need to see a passage like this always, uh, within the context of what the writer, Matthew in this case, is seeking to do. And last Monday, as I, I listened to Tim Blackman uh, and his presentation of the temptation of Jesus, uh, he was telling us, telling you that what Matthew is doing here is showing us Jesus, not just as a kind of E.T. who drops in from the sky and does some wonderful things. He sees Jesus as the new Adam. Uh, he's bringing a whole new humanity to birth. He sees Jesus as the true Israel of God, fulfilling the scriptures of the prophets with many echoes of that story of the Old Testament. So here is Matthew saying, here is the true Son of God, the one who, unlike Israel, who was God's firstborn son, uh, would be faithful to him and be obedient to him as he proves through the temptations in the wilderness after his baptism. Here, says Matthew, here is the beloved servant of the Lord, as the Father identified him at his baptism, the one who will fulfill the mission of Israel to bring light and blessing to all the nations on the earth. And now at last, says Matthew, after all that preliminary there in chapters 1, 2, and 3, through his infancy uh, and the stories of the Magi and everything else, now it's time to go. It's time to get this thing on the road. Uh, and so in these past few chapters, John has baptized him. God has identified him. The devil has tested him. And it's time now to be on the move. And so let's look at these paragraphs here, these three phases uh, in verses 12 to 25 of Matthew chapter 4. We see three things. One, Jesus launches his mission. Secondly, Jesus calls his disciples. And thirdly, Jesus demonstrates the power of God's kingdom. So first of all, in verses 12 to 17, Jesus launches his mission, but does so with resonances and echoes from the Scriptures. Matthew tells us that Jesus moved to Capernaum in Galilee. He had, of course, been brought up in Galilee. He lived in Nazareth, uh, for, that was his home. But up to this point, he'd been down further south in Judea with the Jordan, being baptized by John. And now he moves to make the base of his ministry the small town of Capernaum, probably about the same size as Nazareth, but more strategically placed because it's right there on the lake. That's where all the commerce goes through. That's where the fishing boats are plying. That's where the roads meet that are coming from the north and south. So Capernaum and Galilee was a, a significant and useful base for the ministry that he was about to begin. But it was significant in other ways, not just strategic. Uh, 
two particular ways that I think Matthew wants us to hear as he recites it. Because in moving to Galilee and making Galilee the focus of his mission, Jesus is both following the character of God and the mission of God. The character of God, because what was Galilee? Well, Galilee was the despised part of Israel. It was the farthest away from Jerusalem and the temple. It was a mixed region. It was much more economically poor. It was riddled with Gentiles coming through, and it was so close to uh, Syria to the northeast and Phoenicia to the northwest, and uh, across the Galilee were the Gentiles and the pigs and all of that stuff. So Galilee was the despised part of the place, and that's where God would have gone. That's where you'd find God, in fact. I don't think Matthew uh, quotes it, but he might well have had in mind what God had said in Deuteronomy chapter 10, that the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, rules the universe, runs the universe, but where will you find him? He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. He loves the foreigner residing among you, plenty of them in Galilee, giving them food and clothing, and so you are to love the foreigner, the immigrant, the refugee. That's where you'll find God, among the homeless and the familyless and the landless. And that's where Jesus goes. In a sense, that's where his father would have gone, like father, like son, to the last, the least, and the lost Galilee. But not only following the character of God, he's also following the mission of God, because that's why I think Matthew does specifically quote from Isaiah referring, as you can see there, to, uh, to Galilee. He describes it in the words of Isaiah chapter 9 as the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee of the Gentiles. Of course, you know the word just means the nations. And that says uh, the people, says, Jeremiah, says Isaiah, that's where the people were living in darkness. That's where they'd not yet received the light of God, which in Old Testament times was to be in the light of Israel, and then, of course, the dawning light of the coming Messiah. And so here is Matthew saying that God's mission for Israel is ultimately going to reach to the ends of the earth. That's precisely what he told Abraham. Through you, all nations will be blessed. I have made you to be a light to the nations, says God to Israel. And so here is Jesus, the Son of God, the servant of the Lord, the embodiment of Israel's identity. And where does he go? To Galilee of the Gentiles, Galilee of the nations. So by locating himself there, and by Matthew quoting from the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus himself, in a sense, is anticipating what will come in the future. His own mission, of course, as we know from Matthew's gospel and elsewhere, his own earthly mission was predominantly among his own people, calling the people of Israel back to God, which was the task of the servant, with a few significant exceptions when he went outside the boundaries of Israel. But when you come to the end of Matthew's gospel, what do we find those famous words there in Matthew 28? Now says Jesus, the risen Jesus, now it's time to go and make disciples of all the nations, just as I made disciples of you in Galilee of the nations. So here is uh, Jesus launching his mission with these resonances of Scripture. It's a geographical location. It might just look like a little detail. He went to Capernaum. Okay, so what? But it's a geographical location that's full of theological meaning and missional intention. So that's the first thing. Jesus launches his mission, verses 12 to 17. Then secondly, Jesus calls his followers to radical discipleship between verses 18 to 20. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but three times in those verses, we read the words, and they followed him. They're identical words in the Greek. It's there in verse 20, Peter and Andrew followed him. It's there in verse 22, James and John, the two brothers, sons of Zebedee, they followed him. And it's also there in verse 25 to describe the large crowds, and they followed him. I was fascinated by that, and I I quickly sort of skimmed through the rest of Matthew's gospel, and he refers to these crowds again and again. They're always there, uh, mostly favorably, uh, hearing Jesus, listening to his teaching, uh, admiring him, wondering how amazing this is, uh, being healed of their diseases, approving of what he's doing, and so on, until the end of the gospel in chapter 27, verse 20, when they've turned against him. (laughs) 
and they're crying out, no, no, we don't want him, we want Barabbas, crucify him. Same crowds. There's probably because all their hopes that this Jesus they were so following and admiring was going to be their messianic leader in some great apocalyptic war against Rome, and when he disappointed those hopes, the crowd stopped following him and turned against him. So Jesus had many followers in Matthew's gospel, but very few disciples. Followers, like Twitter followers, you know, just follow, 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 wherever he goes to watch. But Jesus' call to these men, who eventually become 12 of them, uh, is a call to a kind of following which wasn't just for the sake of the healings and the excitement and everything else, but it was a call into a radical form of discipleship which would cost them virtually everything and for some of them would cost them their lives. Now, it's probable when we read these verses, it may seem that Jesus just turns up one day at the side of Lake Galilee and says to a couple of guys, come and follow me, and they do. But almost certainly it took longer than that. Uh, John tells us, John chapter 1, uh, how Andrew, Peter's brother, had been a disciple of John the Baptist, and then John the Baptist pointed, him, pointed them to Jesus, and then he goes and finds Peter. Uh, we know also that of Nathaniel and Philip. Luke chapter 5 tells us of another encounter of Jesus with Peter by the lake uh, when he was teaching from the boat, and that may have been before this or after it. It's very probable, most likely, uh, that Jesus knew these guys. Jesus was a skilled tradesman. Uh, His father was a carpenter, is the usual translation. Uh, But the word means not just a, a worker in wood, it means basically a handyman, someone who was skilled at working with wood and stone and often such people were itinerant. So it's very possible that during his 20s, Jesus of Nazareth was was around that area, uh, mending the boats, helping with any small projects, earning a living for Mary and and his siblings and so on. So very probably he was a known figure. Uh, And his summons therefore in chapter four, verses 18 to these men didn't just come completely out of the blue, but it was radical, it was challenging. In fact, it was challenging culturally, economically, and socially. First of all, it was culturally surprising. Because in Jesus' day, rabbis did not usually choose their own disciples. What happened was uh, that a young person, a young man, would choose a rabbi uh, and say, I want to be your disciple. Will you please take me on and teach me? You sort of chose your curriculum with a particular rabbi. But you remember how Jesus said to his disciples significantly, you did not choose me, I chose you. And Jesus didn't just choose a bunch of bright young boys eager to learn uh, the Torah with him like students. No, he chose working men, artisans, tradesmen, small business people like James and John probably were. And then he uses their skills and their profession as a metaphor for what discipleship would mean. Very interestingly, just like God had called Moses and David, who were both shepherds, and then called them to be shepherd leaders of their people, so here Jesus calls fishermen and says, I tell you what, I'm going to make you fishers of people. Probably a metaphor meaning you will be the ones who will help me gather Israel in, back into repentance and faith and obedience. So his calling was culturally contextual to their work, but also at the same time surprising in taking the initiative in calling them in the first place. Secondly, perhaps more significantly, it was economically costly. You see, fishermen uh, at that time, they were not peasants. They were not the poorest of the poor, these disciples. Uh, The the, the fishing business around Galilee was a business. Uh, It was abundant, fish were caught, they were either eaten right away, but more often they would be dried or pickled, or salted, and then exported around the country. Fish oil was used in lamps. Fishing was a good business. And Luke tells us, Luke chapter 5, verse 10, that uh, the brothers, Peter and Andrew, and James and John, were probably in some kind of joint family little consortium under Zebedee. Uh, and quite profitable it was because Mark tells us that they had hired servants as well as the brothers. So here's a family business. And to leave that behind was going to be a big risk, especially if uh, the the strapping second-generation adult men who could run the boats and man the boats left. Uh, 
So from the Gospels, we see that Jesus himself was making a kind of circuit of the Galilee region, all within walking distance, of course, but it would mean long periods away from home. And you remember how Jesus himself said uh, to people who wanted to follow him, he said, look, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, which probably means he had to be a guest in other people's homes or sometimes even just to sleep outside. And so here, these disciples are becoming, instead of supporters of their own family, they're becoming dependent on other people's generosity and support. It was no wonder that they said to Jesus on one occasion, we've left everything to follow you. Sort of subquote, what's in it for us, as it were. And, and Jesus has to say that no one who has left everything for my sake in the kingdom will not be rewarded in so many different ways. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that someone finds and sells everything that they have in order to obtain. So you see, following Jesus, like the crowds, costs nothing. They were mainly in it for the benefits that Jesus bestowed on them, the healing, the teaching, the blessings they received from him. But following Jesus as a disciple was costly, economically costly. They would drop down the income level to become dependent. So it was culturally surprising, it was economically costly, and it was socially scandalous. Matthew tells us in verse 22 that they not only left their boats but also their, and their business, but also their father. And for that time, at least, it probably meant that they left their wives and their families as well as they followed Jesus. And, of course, probably they went back home from time to time, and it wasn't necessarily the whole of the time, but nevertheless, this was a significantly socially offensive thing to do. That's why when Jesus told somebody who wanted to follow him and said he wanted to go and bury his father first, and Jesus comes out with that incredibly offensive saying, let the dead bury their dead, you come and follow me. Now, we need to be careful. We're not suggesting here that Jesus was anti-family, as is sometimes alleged by some commentators. In other parts of the gospel, we know that Jesus strongly defends the foundation of marriage and the sanctity of marriage. He condemns those who were abdicating their duty as children for their elderly parents uh, and says you are, you know, breaking the law of God by your traditions in doing that. But what he is saying here is that in the ultimate priority of things, the kingdom of God comes first. And that would mean that for these disciples. And it means it certainly for some people in today's world. Might mean it for some of you, I don't know. But sometimes being a Christian disciple, not by your own choice, can sometimes be out of sync with what your family wants for you or what they plan for you. And certainly for many in other parts of today's world, to follow Jesus is to lose your family, not by your choice, but knowing that that will be the cost. You can be excluded and thrown out. So here's a very hard issue to face. It's a difficult balance between putting the kingdom of God above family responsibility, which we have, uh, and neglect, and, and somehow getting this balance between neglect and misplaced zeal and doing what Jesus wants. But at any rate, let's recognize that this call to follow Jesus and radical discipleship uh, had a, a cultural dimension, an economic dimension, and a social dimension. And in all of those ways, it could be costly. And all I want to say here at this point is, if those were some of the demanding dimensions of what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus then, in a way that distinguished the disciples from the crowds, the disciples from the followers, what are those dimensions today? What does Christian identity and Christian allegiance mean for you? In any sense comparable to what it meant for those first disciples. Because it seems to have become the case that certainly in many parts of the Western world, uh, some parts of my own country and certainly here in the United States, somehow being a Christian is pretty culturally unsurprising. It might be a bit weird, but, you know, there's no big problem if that's your thing. Uh, it can also become very culturally assimilated and simply co-opted into the dominant culture, so there's no real difference. It can be economically unthreatening, in some cases even advantageous, and it's certainly in most places socially acceptable. So if there's this contrast between what it meant for those first disciples and what it might feel like now for us are we challenged by that? Are we thinking about that? 
So as we read a passage about Jesus calling us to be disciples, I would want to say, what does being a disciple mean for you? Uh, Are you a disciple in your studies? Are you following Jesus in what you study and in what you think about what you study? Is your discipleship affecting your worldview of economics or politics or society or history or whatever else it is? And how will being a disciple of Jesus affect your choices, your radical choices of career choice, uh, of um, marriage choice, of family choice, and so on all the way through? I don't know what it will mean, but at least we need to be asking the question as to what extent our discipleship matches any kind of the radical demand that Jesus made of his disciples. It's one of the things that John Stott, who Dr. Riken mentioned earlier on, emphasized greatly. In fact, his last book that he wrote before he died was called that, and I commend it to you. You should read it, The Radical Disciple. Uh, I think it's possibly on sale at the Hunger Center in, in Barrows there as part of the symposium. So those are the two main things, and the last is very brief. We hardly have time to cover it, Uh, but Jesus has launched his mission on the Scriptures. He's called his disciples, his followers, to radical discipleship. And thirdly, in the last section, Jesus demonstrates God's kingdom in word and deed. In verse 17, we have the message, the summary of the message. Jesus says, repent, because the kingdom of God, the reign of God, is at hand. And then in the verses 23 to 25, we have the mission, the way Jesus embodies that message of the good news of the kingdom of God. It's good news because it's telling us that God reigns in a world in which they thought Caesar reigns. No, Jesus is Lord. God is becoming king. And so therefore, turn and follow him and put your life into the kingdom of God. And then, as you know, the very next chapter, Matthew goes on into the Sermon on the Mount to show us what living in God's kingdom will mean in terms of our ethical discipleship. So verse 17 is the message, and then verses 23 to 25 is a summary of the mission. And you notice how holistic it is. Jesus is involved in announcing. There's a proclaiming of the kingdom. He's also engaged in teaching, explaining what it means in their synagogues, and he's involved in healing. He's actually doing good works. And so the rest of the Gospels will show him engaging with the poor, with the outcast, with the prostitutes, with the tax collectors, and breaking down all these social barriers. And then Matthew circles right back and tells us that Jesus' reputation went right out through Syria. And so it's not just to, and the Decapolis, not just to the tribes of Israel that were despised up in the north, but even out to the ends of the earth. And so Matthew is showing us that this Jesus who was born to be king of the Jews is now being acknowledged and recognized by the nations around. He was born to be the glory of his own people as their Messiah, but now he's becoming a light to lighten the Gentiles to the ends of the earth. I don't imagine that Andrew and Peter and James and John understood much of that uh, when they decided to follow Jesus and become his disciples. They were pretty confused about it even the next couple of years. But nevertheless, they stepped out onto a costly, scandalous path of discipleship in following Jesus. And this morning we ask ourselves, is that what we are also prepared to do, to follow them in following him? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its challenge. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who calls us to follow him. And we said, we sang, that we decided to do that. Lord, please make that real for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.